Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Planet. I'm president of AIA Ohio. I'd like to welcome you to the fourth session of our advocacy series. Thanks for joining us uh, for what I think is going to be a really interesting session today. Um, joining us, we, we have um, a distinguished panel from across the country that will be sharing their experiences advocating for what they're most passionate about and how the AIA has provided them with a platform and opportunities to become advocates for their communities. Uh, the format for today's session will be a panel discussion. Our goal today is for you to be inspired by our guests and for you to discover new pathways within the AIA to expand your advocacy efforts. Before we get started today, I'd like to recognize and thank our AI Ohio featured gold sponsor for today's program, which is Marsh Building Project Products. Uh, Marsh is a locally owned wholesale distributor of high quality building products, including Marvin Windows and Doors. They have offices in Columbus, Dayton, Loveland, and Montgomery, Ohio, and Fort Thomas in Lexington, Kentucky. Joining us today is a longtime sponsor and supporter of AIA, Dave Green. Uh, Dave, could you please introduce yourself and give us maybe a five minute brief discussion and an update on what's new with Marsh? Dave? Great, thank you. Good afternoon, Dave Green with Marsh Building Products, Marvel Windows and Doors. We uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk today, and we are huge advocates for full-service architecture and have been for many years. Uh, we've been involved with the AIA and more specifically probably CRAN here in Cincinnati since its inception maybe 15, 17 years ago. Um, we love working with architects. I'm in architects' offices all day. In fact, today I'm, I'm in the middle of an architect blitz for those firms that are letting people in. We've been visiting firms this morning and just updating them on the Mar Marvin product line. So uh, I run the Terra Cincinnati market for Marvin Windows and Doors. I've got five employees that all we do is Marvin Windows and Doors all day long, but we are a distributor of high-end uh, building products as, um, as Karen said, and thank you, Karen, for the introduction. And by the way, Karen's firm, RWA, I'm in there at least once a week and enjoy those uh, collaborations with those guys and a lot of the firms in Cincinnati as well. But we are trying to expand our footprint. We've got um, you know, offices in Columbus and Dayton and Cincinnati, and we're trying to get more involved in those markets from an architect. It seems like Cincinnati has a pretty good architectural uh, uh, community here that we're pretty involved with. Um, um, I, uh, I've been doing this for 27 years, been involved with the architects ever since. Um, we have been a sponsor of the Crayon Awards Banquet since they uh, started those probably in 2003. And um, we, you know, execute residential, commercial, institutional uh, through multiple sales channels with architects, building owners, contractors, commercial contractors, remodeling contractors, new home builders. So we're in just about every market and we thoroughly enjoy working at every market and we especially enjoy working with the architects and from conception through design development and final design specifications we're here to help and support uh, all the architects that we can and all the markets that we can get to so again we're trying to expand into northern ohio a little bit more we don't have an office up in cleveland yet we've done a few jobs up there but uh, please reach out to us for any of your window and door needs marvin is our main product line we do carry some other commercial products like Quaker windows for aluminum uh, products, uh, Panda windows and doors. Uh, we've done some nano wall jobs. Um, we also carry Dynamic, which is a steel uh, window and door company out of Vancouver, Canada. If you need steel windows and doors, they typically compete with Hopes or uh, Brumball or those steel companies. Those are becoming very, very popular. But Marvin's our main line, spend most of our time with Marvin windows and doors. So. Again, we thank you for the opportunity to speak and we are more than happy to sponsor as many architectural organizations as we can to help you guys out and advocate for your success. Thank you, Dave. And if you don't know thank Dave you. already, please you know, reach out to him. He's a great, great resource for our industry. And we appreciate your long-term support um, of AIA Cincinnati, but of course, AI Ohio in the convention over the years. Um, You're welcome, glad to do it. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Thank um, you. I'll move on to the next slide. So we also like to thank our all of our annual sponsors. The logos are on your screen now. Um, we do have some good news to share today. Senate Bill 49, the payment assurance uh, for design professionals, uh, was unanimously passed by the Senate and assigned to the House Commerce and Labor Committee. 
where the sponsor hearing is actually happening today at 2 p.m. Um, this is a proactive legislation um, and you can see I've, we've got the roadmap up from our Government 101 session so you can see the dates and how our bill is progressing on our roadmap. Um, this is a this type of legislation which is proactive um, is not possible without the support of um, the AI Ohio PAC contributors, many of which are with us today. Um, on the slide, you can see everyone's name is contributed. If you've not already, please consider joining your fellow colleagues, make a contribution to the AIO PAC um, so that we can continue to have a strong voice advocating for the profession in the state of Ohio. Um, at this point, so mark your calendar. So the next advocacy series session entitled Implementing a Successful Advocacy Plan is scheduled for Wednesday, June 30th. We'll be hearing from AIA components across, across the United States about how they started their advocacy committees and what it takes to make them thrive. Um, we also have upcoming a, um, one of our design lectures this next week on the 27th. We'll have Monica Chandra. Uh, let's see, I hope everyone uh, enjoys. Um, let's see, where am I here? Missed this. Okay, finally, I'd like to thank our advocacy series committee members. My co-chair, Bruce Sikanik, FAIA from AIA Youngstown, Matt Toddy, AIA from AIA Columbus, and our executive director, Kate Brunswick. Uh, Matt will be hosting our panel discussion today and Bruce will be hosting the Q&A. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items. Our program today is scheduled for one and one half hours. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box. Uh, we'll be hosting a, a Q&A session at the end, um, but certainly welcome questions during the panel discussion as well. So um, Matt, let's uh, meet our panelists and get the discussion started. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, get to introduce our three panelists to you today, and I'm actually going to let them sort of introduce themselves, but uh, joining us today uh, for this conversation on um, advocacy and you is Laura T. Garden from AIA Indiana, uh, Cindy Schwartz from AIA National, and Patri Acevedo from AIA South Dakota. Uh, so Laura, would you, would you mind kick us off and, and just kind of let us know a little bit about yourself and, uh, and your involvement with the Institute. Sure. Um, as Matt mentioned, I'm an architect in Indianapolis. Um, I actually am a project architect at Ratio. And I also have my own um, business as well. Um, that business is where I have become a published author. And I, um, I speak to other AI members, such as you guys. Um, most specifically about my passion to mentor young professionals and volunteer. Um, and that's actually where Matt Toddy and I first met as a part of um, volunteering alongside each other on the Young Architects Forum. Um, I'm a 2017 Young Architect Award national winner, uh, the 2019 chair of the Young Architects Forum, the 2020 president of AIA Indianapolis, and I now serve as an at-large representative on the AIA National Strategic Council with Pottery. And you might see random dogs as I go through uh, <laughs> today, so. Thanks, Laura. Um, Cindy, how about, uh, how about you? Could you uh, introduce us to, to what you do at AIA National? Yes, uh, so I am the Managing Director of Government Advocacy and Operations. Um, that means I uh, manage our state um, and federal and local uh, and international uh, advocacy efforts for the Institute. Um, I come to AIA from a very circuitous route. Um, I have worked in the nonprofit world and um, I work with um, the Port of Baltimore and uh, other organizations on the left side of the aisle. Uh, I've done political, hardcore political work, but the essence of what I do and what I bring to AIA is a long, uh, a long history of advocacy in the government, legislative, and political realm. Oh, and I also run the PAC, Park and PAC. Last but not least, right? Never. <laughs> right. 
That's great. Uh, Patri, how about, how about you? Um, any, anything exciting happened recently over there for you? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Matt, for setting me up for that. Um, what Matt is alluding to, uh, not so thinly veiled, is that I was recently named a 2021 Bush Fellow, um, and that is through the Bush Foundation, which is a um, a large region, regional uh, foundation that is uh, that has a mandate to support community leaders through uh, leadership development and whatever uh, realm they they look to do. Aside from that, I am also an architect in Rapid City, South Dakota, and the market leader for JLG Architects. Um, I was born and raised in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Then I moved to New York. Then I moved to Florida. Then I moved to Texas. Before uh, we. Uh, quite literally landed in uh, in the Black Hills and calling it our homes. And that is because my husband was active duty military. I bring this up because that taints a lot of how I how I do things and the, the level of involvement I have both at the, the local, the state and the national level. It is really important to, for me to feel like I belong somewhere and I have found a way to do that. Um, like Laura was saying, I also serve as an at-large member of the AIA Strategic uh, Council. And I, I was uh, elevated to that position by bringing a unique voice for a small but really mighty component um, of, uh, of the AIA South Dakota, but also representing um, a rural voice that nobody was like speaking to. Um, and now I also serve as the council's vice moderator. I, I am also honored to have served through all of the stages of uh, AIA South Dakota's leadership track. And now in my retirement years, I'm still very involved in their uh, advocacy uh, efforts. Um, because even though, again, it's a small component, it's really mighty when it comes to the impacts that we make at a national level because of the work that we do. Um, and that I'll leave it at that. That's, that's really great. I'm, I'm, Really excited to hear a little bit more about that, Patri, and, and really from, from all of us, congratulations on the Bush Fellowship. That's phenomenal. Um, I, we, can, we can just sort of snake draft this until we uh, get to, you know, more, uh, more conversation, but feel free to interject at any time. But I'm curious, Patri, you know, how did, how did the, your individual passions um, sort of inform the, the pathway that you've taken to get where you are now? I have, a, I have a rule that gets me in trouble a lot. And it's that um, if I see something that I think I can have a hand in, in, in fixing and make it better, I have to raise my hand. It's sort of this sense of duty. Um, so realizing that nobody was, uh, nobody was speaking for rural and remote areas, by the sense of definition, Rapid City is not a uh, rural uh, city. Uh, we are at about 80,000 uh, people. So that puts us in a micropolitan uh, um, realm. But but because of the, the remoteness, uh, I joke that we are a ge geographical oddity. We're like two weeks from absolutely everywhere and almost like 10 years behind most, uh, most other places. Um, it puts us in a place where we have to be resilient. And I realize that there's a lot of people like us, not in a lowly populated state, but I have found that this resonates a lot with um, members in the, the Ohio Valley area, in upstate New York, and even places that we consider more populated. So because I have this like self-imposed rule that if I see that somebody is not being represented and I can, and I am part of that group, I have to raise my hand. Um, I did, so that's where my passions are sort of all starting to come together or are, are fully coming together. And that's why I volunteer for things. And that's how I end up getting in trouble to be honest with you. I can relate to that, Patrick. That's uh, <laughs> the the hand raising is a, it can be it can be a problem yeah. sometimes, right? Cindy, how about how about for you? Um, how did I? Get, well, so I come as I said, I have thirty five years almost in to organizing. Um, I have a degree in uh, theater set design, uh, which led me to this, right? <laughs> So uh, essentially what happened was, is I found myself working in a small company and, you know, always sort of figured that, you know, being an artist was what I wanted to be. But then I, after I started working, I was like, you know, really, I, 
I want to make a difference, but I didn't really know what that meant. And uh, a long time ago, I was living in New Jersey and needles for, I don't know, those of you who might remember this, needles were washing up on the beaches and I lived at the Jersey Shore. And I was like, wow, that sucks. That's not cool, right? And I saw an ad for canvassing because I needed a job because I was quitting my job. And I thought, well, let me go see what this is. And long story short, I knocked on some doors and people gave me contributions because I, I persuaded them to. And I learned that I have this power to, uh, and that gets me in trouble, Patri, uh, which is that I am persuasive. And uh, for whatever reason, people follow me. And uh, I think it's because I can connect with people, but mostly I think it's because I demonstrate passion about things. Um, because what really mattered to me was that I was helping the environment, um, that I was, uh, and, and the ability to use my voice to do that just was electrifying for me. And uh, I changed my career. I started doing political campaigns, which is when the whole world just lit up on fire for me. I love a campaign where I hone my skills. And, uh, and I've been traveling the path ever since. But ultimately, uh, what I do comes down to two things now for me. One is being able to uh, use my voice which is important to me personally, uh, but professionally what I like to do and what really gets me up in the morning is giving other people the ability to use their voice and teaching them how to do it and um, providing tools and, and opportunities for them to actualize their passion. I'm really glad that you're here with us today because that's exactly what we're hoping to achieve with this this really entire series that we've been doing here in, in Ohio, um, this being the fourth fourth of uh, six parts. So I'm glad to hear that. Thanks, Cindy. Yeah, I'm glad to be here, and I really applaud you guys for doing this. It's a, it's, I mean, you know, it does my heart good, right? It's it's awesome that it's uh, and it's super useful, and it's useful because uh, the more folks who get active in Ohio, the more folks will get active at the federal level. The more folks who get active at the federal level will pay attention to what's going on at their local level. Getting, uh, getting engaged is addictive. Once you do it, you want to do more because it feels good. So I, I pledge you guys for doing this. Yeah. Laura, you, you kind of mentioned, um, you know, our, our stories intersected a few years ago on the Young, Young Architects Forum, but Obviously, you uh, you had started to kind of establish your voice in the profession long before that. I'm I'm kind of curious to hear more about, um, you know, what the, the the chicken and the egg. What came first, the 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 passion for advocacy or the involvement in the institute that kind of gave you a platform? Uh, that's a good question, and I don't know that I actually fully know the answer. Um. I joined AIA in 2014 um, as I was getting close to finishing, finishing my licensure. I had just moved back to Indianapolis at that point in time um, and had started interacting with some architects online, uh, both people who were also studying for their tests and other people that I saw as kind of mentors, my, uh, my board of trustees, board of directors, uh, as some people like to call it. Um, and so I started sharing, you know, things that I was learning in that testing process and that kind of just organically grew um, to, to the ability to then advocate for young professionals, both online as well as in the local AIA chapter. And we have a really great executive director in Jason Shelley at our state and local level. Um, and if you see some, it's kind of like what Patry mentioned, if you see something and say, hey, I think we could do this better, his response is gonna be, okay, take it on. Um, so I started kind of doing that from a young professional standpoint. We had a relatively thriving, thriving local YAF chapter uh, in Indianapolis, um, but I saw some missing pieces from a, a point of helping young professionals get licensed and start those early 
steps in their career. Um, and because of my interactions online with other professionals uh, across the nation, I had already started blogging about those topics because I wanted to fill in the missing pieces. I wanted to help those conversations along. Um, so I think they kind of like went hand in hand unknowingly and only looking back, do you actually see the thread continue? Um, because that mentorship and like teaching myself how to write in a casual communicative form um, then helped the process of publishing the books and having that crowd then meant that I already had people who I knew that information would be helpful for. Um, and showing that acumen with those skills was what led me to be um, recruited as PR chair for the National Young Architects Forum, um, which then kind of continued that ball rolling. And, you know, the, the latest book iteration is actually aimed at much smaller children because I realized that we need to start this conversation a lot earlier if we're going to start advocating for equity in the profession. We need to have the ideas of architecture and the world around us in front of little kids when they're just now starting to understand what the world is. So it, it all kind of just organically happened because I pursued passion and because I had a supportive network in the AIA. That's uh, that's a really, really good answer. I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I see there's some chatter in the chat about your book. There's an Amazon link. Definitely recommend everyone check that out. My kids love your book as well. So um, I think at, at this point, just a question for all three of you. So feel free to, to jump in. You know, Cindy, you connected uh, this idea of passion and persuasion. You know, I think as architects, we're not really strangers to the idea of the pitch. Um, or trying to convey a, a big idea or a concept. But a lot of times that can go off the rails a little bit when it's something that's not, you know, a, a building or a, or a design. Um, so, you know, our members in Ohio here, we're, we all have different backgrounds, obviously. Um, and advocacy can sometimes kind of fall on the lower end of the priority list. So I'm curious what, um, what you would say to, to someone who might be, um, not challenged, but maybe just a, a little anxious about jumping into uh, the advocacy world, um, whether it's political or, or not, um, given that, you know, these passions and, and the, the idea that we're all at least a little bit equipped to be that kind of persuasive personality. Um, I, un oops, go ahead, Patrick. Go oh, ahead. I, um, I was going to say that we need to start by realizing that what we do is not one building at a time. When you drive into a new city, the first thing you see, your first impression is going to be architecture. So we need to start lifting uh, our head up from, from the one thing we are designing and understanding that we're part of a system that's designing what the community looks like. So for us to start like freeing ourselves from the one thing at a time and realizing the impact that we're making bigger is going to start giving you bigger um, better language, right? Like I love that Cindy was talking about it in terms of superpower and Laura didn't say superpower and superpower for Cindy had to do with persuasion. Laura didn't put it in terms of superpower, but she really has a superpower of being able to share complex ideas in a way that the audience is going to understand it, right? If I had to say my superpower, I joke that it's access. I can pretty much get myself into a situation where I can talk to anyone, right? Like I can, I, I can figure out a way in which I can connect myself to, to get the audience that I need in some ways. And I think it has to do with that. It's like realizing that what we are doing, we are delivering the product one building at a time, but the impact we're making is large and it's community wide. So for us to be able to advocate for policy and planning to be done in a better way um, is important. I think architects we like to think that we are at the forefront of a lot of things, but we end up still being reactive to zoning, planning, building codes. So for us to start, which is what Cindy like is in part of, right? Like for us to model what we want that to really look like in the ideal world, I think is really important. Otherwise, we will continue being just reactive to things. 
Uh, I'm going to, I'll add to that because I think your Patri is exactly right. And it's the idea, the idea of communicating your passion. But the, the thing to always remember when you're trying to add the persuasion piece of it to it is to start where they are. You, your goal is to get folks to open their ears and, and accept your passion and hear what you have to say, right? There needs to be an open exchange. The act of opening an ear for a human means that you need to speak to them and not at them. So when you're framing up what you wanna say, which you need to do, right? Just sort of spouting off a bunch of stuff off the top of your head is probably, at least from a political perspective, isn't the best way to go. <laughs> um, but so be prepared. But um, framing that in a way that your audience can actually accept what you have to say is a really, really key technique. And what that does is it it opens their ears, as I said, but it also puts people in a receiving frame of mind because they feel empathy for you. They feel as if you are con trying to, as Patrick said, connect to them and not slam them with your idea, right? It is a, it is a, uh, it is a non-aggressive way to communicate, but it is not a passive way to communicate, right? It is a way of engaging with people. We use the term in advocacy when we're communicating and talk about organizing people. We use the term engage a lot. And that's a purposeful word because uh, to engage, not, not, not people over the head, but to engage is to, to come together with people, right? It's to find the common ground and find commonality. And, and it's, a, it's a really important concept. Um, Matt, the, I'll add one more piece of this, which is um, you should never, from a legislative perspective, legislators or politicians, you should never not want to communicate with them because they want to communicate with you. Politicians are animals who are oriented towards people. They are people, people, right? That's why they get into politics. They have passions they want to exercise and this is their path, but they need you. They need to know that you're there building that one building that influences the entire community. They need, to, they, they need you to tell them the story so that they can frame in their mind how to tell the story, so that they can feel, they can tell that story back to their constituents or their colleagues when they're trying to persuade them. So you should never ever feel like they don't wanna to talk to you because they're eager. And that, that's just, that is something I've learned from working with legislators for over literally 35 years, building relationships with legislators. They are so eager and hungry to have that relationship and that expert counsel that you provide. Cindy, I was going to add that what I have found is that I have to make their time worth it. I want to get yeah. something out of it. I know they want to get something out of it as well. And I always leave the door open of like, how can I help you? And it's interesting. We've had, we've asked for support on bills at the state uh, level. And in return, they have asked us to review bills and get them input as well. So then that's when I joke about access, it's like, then you're opening that door for that relational like uh, situation. It's, yep, it's all about the ear. I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, in, in hearing, hearing you talk about this and Cindy, this is, this is obviously your arena, but you know, there's a lot of, um, I guess the line between political advocacy and just general advocacy, um, uh, being passionate for a, a certain, um, thing can, that line can awfully, can get awfully blurry sometimes. So I'm, I'm wondering how do you, how do you contextualize that in the work that you're doing? And do you see it as a distinct boundary or are really do the worlds overlap more than, more than you think otherwise? Well, so professionally, my world is legislative, political and codes advocacy because I also run our codes program. Um, and uh, so in my world, they're all, they're all blurred together because that's, that's it. When you step outside of that and you talk about um, 
advocating in non-political legislative ways, which can, right? I mean, you know, I say when I train folks, I, I train, I do a lot of student training, you know, and I say, you know, we're all advocating all the time. You know, every time you ask your folks for additional money because you need it for, you know, whatever to go out next weekend, then you're advocating, <laughs> right? It's not advocating just means you're just, you're putting out your position, you're framing up your, uh, you're framing it up and you're making the ask. That's really all advocacy is. So I guess I contextualize it in that frame, which is we're all advocating all the time. I just laser focus it towards politics, towards legislation, towards code, you know, getting better codes. So. I think for me, political advocacy is hard because I am the person that Cindy doesn't like. Like, it freaks me out to talk to politicians. Um, <laughs> I I have a hard time with it. Um, but as I have continued to informally share what I've learned with other young professionals and talk about mentorship and talk about equity in the profession, I have started to see those overlaps in how what's happening in the political realm directly affects the workplace and directly affects those goals of equity in the profession and directly affects my working life as a young professional. Um, so they have to overlap. Um, otherwise, if you're not speaking to those things that, that have those impacts, you're just, it's going to impact on you. Um, so it's, so Laura, it, it's a struggle. It. I'm sorry. Yeah, I would, so Laura, what I would say to you is, uh, one, uh, it, it's not dislike, you're a challenge. You're, you're like, right. That's, you're the, you're the ones we need, right. Um, because you get it, you make the connection, you understand the importance. What I would say about uh, talking to legislators, one, uh, if it's because you don't like them and you, hold, you, know, you hold the process in disdain, you know, the process is important. And sometimes we have to do things we don't want to do or talk to people we don't want to talk to because it's what we need to do to further our cause. That's the first thing I'd say. If it's because you're nervous, don't be nervous because there are regular folks. They put their pants on like everybody else. They want to talk to you. They would be extremely excited to meet you, given your background, given what you're doing with young people and the fact that you're a professional. Like there's a whole lot of things about you that you bring to the table that is going to be very interesting for them. Um, and then I, guess I think that's, I, well, I'll stop it. Cindy, I completely agree, and it, it is all about storytelling. The first time that I went to the AI National Grassroots event, it was the scariest thing, right? They give me, they give you training, they treat you very like well, they send you out there like ready to speak, but it's up to you, right? And my congressional delegation is three people. We we call them by their first names because this is South Dakota, right? It's John John Thune, it's Dusty. Johnson, and then it's Mike Rounds. Um, I needed to figure out how I was going to connect with them based on what their interests were, right? Like Mike Rounds is 100% like all about military. And I know like we got here because of the base. So I can start telling, weaving my story, making the connection of this is how you get me as a young professional with a young family. It's economic development, right? And from then on, I can tell them like, how some of the policies impact some of the like funding strategies impact uh, my projects, right? For um, for Dusty, it is it is a very different approach. John Thune was like the same, but it was all like I did some homework. I knew that Dusty was in the what was it labor and education a couple of years back, and we were advocating for something that had to do with school safety. So I knew I could get him in there somehow. But I always start with like. I always start with a, the soft conversation because it makes me feel at ease to be able to tell them about myself. Why should they care? And it's interesting to see them come back and sort of reach out for a building tour or whatever it is. They love these like um, things or a, a grand opening and things like that. But it is, Laura, 
all about the storytelling, which is the part you have down, right? Like it is all about making that connection and then being intentional with a point that you want to deliver in the end. The more that I can illustrate that through an actual project that maybe I offer them a tour of so they can see how the funding strategy, uh, which is discriminatory to a, a remote location, that's value, right? And then they can take that story back. Um, if I hand them a piece of paper that that's like a white paper on pros and cons, like that is going to stop and on the top of the pile, on top of the staffers. But if I tell them a real story, then they can start weaving their own story based on that as well. So just to break that down, Patria, you did a couple uh, textbook things inside of what you just talked about. You did your homework, one. Two, you determined what the, what the connection points were. And you did the, your connection points on two different pieces. One was you made a personal connection with them by talking about your personal experience with the military, having nothing to do with architecture or the buildings or anything, but it has to do with you and that other human being that you're talking to. You made the personal connection. The minute you make a personal connection with anyone, and again, legislators are people, right? The minute you make a connection with someone, you break down a barrier, you, you find a personal connection, and now all of a sudden you can talk to them and you can call them Mike and Dust, right? And the, what you did, to build the connection on the professional level or the topic issue, the thing you went for, was you went where they are. You started where they are, not where you are. So you went and you said, here's kind of what I want to get at, but here's what I know about. I know that they care about these things and you framed up your discussion in that context. And by framing your discussion in a way that they could hear it and that they could, um, they could, they could connect it to themselves, you are able, you're able to have a much better conversation. Cindy, and it can be super simple. I was just going to put on the chat that my human connection with John Thune is that I always wear my most out there Western wear boots and he will always comment on them. <laughs> and then the next time I show up, he remember, he's like, oh, I like these boots the last time. So it can be super yep. small, right? That connection is just hit them the, where they want. So that, that's really interesting. I, I think that's, you know, at, at some level, it's kind of funny, right? Like I'm going to wear these boots down to the state house, but it, it works, right? So Patra, you were, you were talking earlier too about, um, you know, building, building systems and how we're, we're all part of a system. I'm curious to, to hear how, how critical is it to, um, to do this as a, as a team or, or with others and kind of build that network for advocacy to, to really have an effect rather than trying to kind of make it happen on your own or, or, or any, any lived experience on that one. Oh yeah, for sure. So every time we go to grassroots at the national level, there's a team of us, there's a couple of us, right? It really helps um, deflect the stress of us just being one person. And it's like, we sit down and like Cindy was saying, we do our homework, but then we're like, oh, I think I can use this project uh, like to illustrate it. And I can back it up with a different uh, version of it. Being 100% honest, sometimes it gets a little like interesting because like we're competition to each other, right? But making sure that we have the same goal and making sure that we understand that, that if our legislators are in support of X bill or whatever it is, whether it's at the state or national level, we all win as a profession. Um, that's important. South Dakota is one of the top two, like number one uh, trying to, we don't like laws. We don't like licensure. We are free out here. Listen to all the people moving out here to our free state um, because of our uh, political um, environment. So AIA National has provided us excellent support and, and CARB in trying to defeat all of those de-licensing bills. Right. And that that builds coalition pretty quickly. Right. And it is not only we try not to make it about ourselves, but when we are able to figure out who are the critical legislators across the state that we need to hit, and then we call our members, then they feel they're part of something as well. AIA is I don't know how unique it is, but it is, I, we're small and mighty. Advocacy efforts are the number one reason why we continue to have members sign up. And people who are ready to lapse, they continue to sign up. And it is because we can show the work. 
Because we are small, lowly populated, anyone with money can pass the craziest bills you can imagine. So we have to be at the forefront of doing that. So then we build coalition with a state engineer, even with the AGC, different engineering uh, organizations as well. So I'm not even talking about only architect members. Like we had to look around and look for other people who had the same goals as we did. Um, to be able to to come together and advocate to either support or defeat uh, bills, um, it, AI South Dakota is not that strong of a lobbyist by itself, but we're great at building coalition, which is what we do in our projects anyway, right? Like we're arc orchestrating larger projects, so it. It is really critical to our success that we have been able to pull from national and other like state and local groups. For small organizations, it would be really hard otherwise. Yeah, that's really great. I'm 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 curious, um, Laura or Cindy, if, if there's anything that uh, you know you've you've gone through where it's it's kind of been. Um, You've had to do what what Patri is describing and kind of build that coalition to to achieve the ends. I'll jump in here. I mean, AIA works in coalition uh, in a whole number of different ways. I mean, we are in uh, we have the big CEO coalition of major the CEOs, and we're sort of organizing at that level down to specific issue licensure coalitions and um, climate coalitions. Just, we do that all the time. And the reason that we do it is because, as Patrick was explaining, is that there is one power in number. The other reason is that we're not always the best messenger, right? Sometimes there is, uh, you know, someone else in your coalition may have a better relationship or a better way to connect to that member connection, right? Connect to them in a way that they can hear. Um, it, train on this a lot, but one of the, one of the, I think very sort of clearest examples is if you're lobbying on climate change, for example. If you are uh, an environmental organization, which I work for many, a number of environmental organizations over the course of 15 years, but if you're an environmental organization, and you are uh, lobbying a climate denier, um, they're not gonna hear you. They don't really care what you have to say. They don't believe what you have to say. But if a business coalition who has a climate agenda goes in and speaks to a member um, and they're talking to them about uh, you know, jobs and creating good green jobs and the rest of that, that that's a, again, get them to open their ears. It's a way of talking about an issue that, um, that will resonate with them and it's how you move people down a continuum. That work, I mean, is very, is, has, is completely exemplified in the climate change work, at least legislatively. If you look at the transition that's happened over the course of the last 30 years, the 30 years that I've been paying attention to climate issues. And um, it's, there is a, there's a sea change and that's because you, you have to change the way that you speak about things to meet the time, to meet the audience, to meet the feed. And so coalitions allow you to do that and they allow you to coordinate that. Um, Matt, Matt we, we have a question from Elizabeth Murphy um, uh, related to passion. Elizabeth, do you wanna unmute and ask that question? If not, I can ask yeah, it for you. I, I can, I can. Okay. There you go. Uh, for lots and lots of years, I believed that passion was a great motivator. I gave lectures on how to use your passion to get you places. But experience has taught me that passion's not enough. And I was, I heard that word a lot today, and I was kind of hoping I could get some comment on that. Yeah, I, I, I will just jump. I, I just want to say one quick thing, which is I talked about actualizing your passion. Yes, you did. Right. Operationalizing your passion. Because yep. yep. you're right, it's not enough. Patrick, yep. Laura? Yeah, I was actually going to hit on that because I saw it pop up and it's a great question and comment. Um, and I was going to kind of loop that into the overall idea of a network um, working for you. And um, 
and learning from your network. You know, it's a, it's a peer relationship, no matter the age, gender, whatever, of the people in your network. Um, and that goes back to following through on that passion because you can care a lot about whatever the topic is, but if you're not putting in the effort to help make that change or to help show that you care, it's just words. Um, and the people in your network are going to notice that. The people in your peer group are going to notice, oh, they seem to care, but their actions don't really follow that through. Um, and so they know that they they learn they begin to learn that they cannot come to you to actually get things done, which makes you kind of slide out of that network. It makes you less valuable in that network, which then means when you have a question or you need help, they may be less likely to help you. Unfortunately, it, it's a tit for tat sometimes. Um, what I learned early on is I have to give at least five actions of, of help to the one question that I ask, right? Like as, as a young professional, there should be an expectation of mentorship. Mentorship is really huge for me. Um, so you hopefully can surround yourself with mentors in the process, um, but you also, you can't just be asking. You can't run the well dry without doing your own work. Um, that was a lot of metaphors to basically say, like you gotta put in the work. Um, you, you have to follow it up. Um, because otherwise uh, it just, there's no um, bark to the bite, so. Laura, I, I am totally with you on that. And I was thinking about this, like, how do you, like you need the action to back up the passion in some ways, right? Um, before joining JLG, I owned my own company, uh, which grew successfully like for over seven years. And I realized something that in order to be successful, I needed to be, <laughs> I'm going to put this in like very pottery words. I needed to be nice. I needed to do what I said I was going to do. And I needed to do it decently well, right? I didn't need to be the best, but I, and then I started building this rapport for myself. Um, I am a very emotive communicator, as you probably noticed, because I use my hands a lot and it's a, it's just my style of communication. But I realized that I needed to work exactly in what you were saying, Elizabeth, like being able to show concrete examples and show action when I am advocating for something. So I started educating myself on some of the, the backup data because I can tell the most passionate story. But if I didn't have facts and things to be able to substantiate that, then it was falling short. And it was just Patri being very colorful and very like excitedly like speaking to things. Um, and how Laura was saying, it's also um, a lot of thrust and no vector, right? Like you have to have that vector and be able to substantiate all of that passion, like all of that thrust with with a vector of of the action and the concrete example and and the goal like that we're all going for as well as like what the win is when you're advocating for or against something what the ultimate goal of it is but yeah i work really hard at making sure that i have i am comfortable with my facts and figures that i know where they come from because it's something that i know it's my weakest part in communication that's really, it's really interesting. I've, I've, I've heard it said before that, you know, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly, at least at the beginning. It's probably not a, not a like long-term trajectory, but you know, you got to start somewhere, right? And, and experience builds, um, builds confidence and, and it's interesting. Um, yeah, you have to start, you have to start somewhere. I, I guess I'm, I'm curious, um, how has, your experience in advocacy and, and maybe Laura, you can kick this one off. Like first off with the, with blogging and with writing, you know, the ARE sketches and then um, your work on the, on the YAF as, as well as, you know, being a young architect award recipient and then president of AI Indiana now council, like how have these things impacted your career and, and the work that you're doing sort of aside from the Institute? Um, I mean, it all gives merit when you show that you can ship your work, right? When you show that you follow through 
it shows that you're someone that can be given responsibility and given tasks and trusted with things. Um, and as you started to allude to, yeah, like it can be hard and scary when you do it for the first time or the second time or even the 15th time, but you still have to kind of just do it. Um, there are definitely things that I have learned in the process of creating the ARE sketches that then helped me for the second book or helped me for the Little Architects book. But it also has helped me, um, as Patri mentioned, just simply better understand how to break down big ideas, which is powerful and helpful to how I present work or how I have um, concept meetings with clients. Um, so it it spreads itself in different ways and those skills show up in different ways um, outside of the Institute. Uh, I actually helped, um, was hired by the Institute to provide some sketches um, that are on the Brick, I think it's called the Brick website, um, to help break down some ideas uh, for for different things that architects have to deal with as a part of a learning unit. Um, so those things can, when you start showing skills and when you, when you work on your skill and share what you know, um, those things can continue to um, open new avenues that you would have never expected. I mean, the ARE sketches that I would share to help people uh, understand an aspect of historic preservation or town planning as a part of their licensing tests are now shared on town planning websites to help citizens understand what's happening, right? Um, so it's just unknown things and you just have to share what you're passionate about and follow through on that work. Patri, you've, you've obviously leveraged your voice into um, in, into what, what's now the, you know, vice moderator role on the council, uh, Bush fellowship recipient. Like, can you, can you talk a little bit about that on, on your side of things? Uh, of course, I, I am going to address as well. The question from, uh, I'm going to say Celine, uh, because it has a lot to do with leveraging, um, my voice in some ways. Um, they're they're asking about where's that that line between self-interest versus justice for the public good and what i have realized is that i don't know rising tides right lift all boats in some ways so if i am creating a more friendly environment um everybody will benefit from that so my bush fellowship is literally based on um on trying to understand how to create a more equitable approach to policy through advocacy and educating myself further in uh, policy, planning through understanding the language of planning. Uh, a lot of times they're using GIS and really storytelling through maps and what the data tells us, um, the practice of architecture, by starting to really challenge how we are no longer the keepers and the the keepers of all the knowledge and we are not the end all uh, be all of absolutely anything. That idea of the master architect um, has been deflating for a few years now, like to the advantage of uh, our communities, right? Where it's more of an inclusive approach. And the last one is participation. And that has to do with that inclusive approach as to who has the seat at the table and who gets to pull up a, a folding chair if there's not enough seats at the table. Um, so that's, that's that's what I, I that's what I'm looking for um, to to learn. So I'm not sure if I answered your question. I hope I answered like one of the two questions, whether the one on the chat or yours. But um, that that is what I am doing there and and challenging challenging the the perception from inside the council as to what an architect is, because we we really do represent. Uh, our membership, both up to the board and down to the membership in a lot of different levels. Um, so so being the vice moderator, I joke, is a little bit like um, the whip cracker, right? Um, I, I don't get to set the, the vision for it, but I, sh I sure make, 
I make sure that we are building whatever we're building in community and that everybody is along for the ride. I don't need to be to have everybody in agreement. I need to make sure that we have a, the same goal in mind. And I find more often than not that people have the same rubs or challenges, um, whether we say it in the same terms. And that's an easy way for me to build coalition. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, I think that's a, a really good skill set to have too, is to, to recognize those, um, those conversations when the, the end often aligns, but the, the way to get there might look different or the way it's being, right. uh, the semantics might not always align, you know. Um, so Liam, I would, I would welcome you if in, in response, I'd welcome you to unmute and, and ask your question or, or uh, you know, respond to, to Patri's um, answer. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Salim al uh, You could see I'm still having a mask because I'm in a public space. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, Patry has uh, sort of uh, responded partly to a degree to the uh, text I wrote down. Uh, actually, uh, frankly, uh, what I really think here, it looks like uh, my question is about deal more with the definition of advocacy in a way, because uh, actually I was in the previous uh, webinar also, and I left the webinar with the sense that there is a lot of experiences coming from my colleagues all over the United States, uh, but the way these, uh, these experiences were channeled uh, through that webinar in particular, where uh, in essence, though rich, but they are sporadic. Uh, rich by themselves, but sporadic in the sense of that, I was actually looking into some sort of, a little bit more of making distinction about uh, what advocacy is. Uh, is it a political advocacy uh, in order for us as AIA members to really sort of make our life a little bit easier? Uh, or is it something that we have a role uh, in society beyond our immediate interest in, in that sense? Uh, we definitely, last year was a very special year. I don't have to repeat. And it looks like this idea of taking care of the public I'm not talking about architects, I'm talking about the country taking care of itself was very, very strong. And that, that experience, one year experience at least, uh, is really more focused my mind into what advocacy is. Maybe I am talking a little bit more philosophical in a philosophical sense in very general terms, uh, in a way it, uh, I, I am, but in other words, I would like to see, maybe I missed something. Um, I don't wanna say that I know everything, but I know something which uh, the message is, uh, could we have a little bit more a framework of what is advocacy in architecture? Uh, uh, we could say at different levels, different general, like political, economic, uh, social, or what have you. So this is where my question came from. Um, so I'm gonna take a stab at this, Salim, and yeah. thank you for, it's a good question. Um, my perception in your self-interest is I'm going to say a private um, singular advocacy, whereas the public interest, public good, social advocacy is obviously larger profession, um, community-based, mm -hmm. Um, they're, they're two things, but they need to work in tandem. Um, as you mentioned, this past year has been a crazy year. And what we have seen in tandem is we need to care for each other. There's a, there's a need for communal good, but there's also a need for self-care. Because if you wear yourself out trying to care for your community, you can't help your community anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from an AIA advocacy standpoint, both of those things have to work together as well. So we have to do advocacy um, either for 
workplace equity, for workplace regulation, um, for protecting architecture licensing process or what, what it is that architects do in our knowledge base as a whole so that we can then have enough caregiving uh, access or have enough sleep or be paid well enough or be seen as knowledgeable members in our community so that we can continue to do that public good and we can continue to advocate for our communities as it relates to um, equity or climate change or resiliency. Those things have to work together because if we're only thinking about what happens to um, our community and we're working our tail off and not paying attention to workplace legislation that just burns us to the ground, then we can't help our community anymore. Does that help answer your question? Yes, it's very, very, uh, uh, I'm not surprised with what you said. That's what I expect AIA thinks and we suppose all to think about that. Maybe again, humbly, I'm not sure, maybe it's my failure. I didn't know where to go to dig the information, but where is that information? Where is those written document? What are all those guidelines? Is there any document which define uh, what advocacy is from the architectural point of view, from us as a community of architects. That's why I'm looking for. So I'm not surprised what you said and I expected it and that's great, but I want to see it and it's good to, for us to, to, to disseminate that. You know, that's why I'm looking for essentially. I think Thank you very much, Laura. Selim, that's a, that's a great point. And I think that's a, it's actually a really great segue to where, um, we'd like to go next with this conversation is, is where do we start? How do we get involved? Um, and, and maybe that's a question for, um, for all three of you in terms of what's the experience been. I know Cindy, you know, we'd love to hear some, some ways that we can get involved with AI national specifically, but, um, Laura, you actually, you know, you obviously have regional and statewide experience, Patrice, the same. So I'm, I'm curious to, to hear, um, maybe by way of experience, where, where, where do we get started? How do we plug in? Do you want me to kick this? I'll kick this off. Yeah. So at least from the national perspective, um, the way that uh, I would answer that question is one, um, get involved with your components, right? You, you are clearly, um, but they are, the, they are the army on the ground as it were. Um, they know what's going on at the state legislatures. They know what's going on in the, um, at the local level and the, and the council and, and the city hall and the rest of it. At the national level, um, there's a lot of ways to get involved beyond sort of being on the board or being on strategic council, right? There is, um, there's the government advocacy committee. There are all of the 33 uh, knowledge communities. Uh, in our world, we reach out to those knowledge communities um, for that, ex that policy expertise. So if those are places that you're, uh, that you, they're specific, like, you know, healthcare, CAE, the, 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 the CAE KC is a great place for you to get engaged because they're talking about things that you relate to you, that you care about. And we coordinate with them from a policy perspective. Um, the example is, is if you haven't seen it uh, during the last presidential election, we issued a policy platform. First time that we had done that officially. And it's got three different sections, quality of life issues, uh, uh, climate, and then equity. And those all were developed with knowledge communities. They were, it was really this collaborative effort of bringing in the expertise that exists inside the profession to develop these policy platforms. This policy platform, guides our work on Capitol Hill. It is, a, it is the driving force behind how we engage in the infrastructure bill, how we engage uh, in the climate bills that are being put forward. So it is, so it's this very sort of holistic uh, thing. It's a little bit more challenging, I'm not gonna lie, because we're a bigger organization. Um, the, the other thing I would say is when we issue an action alert, click the links, read about it, look at it, you know, like actually send a, a, we make it super easy. It's like, click a button, send a letter to your member of Congress. Can't get easier than that. And in fact, we're, re, we're pushing that tool out to uh, components so that they can have that tool 
and they can get you so that they'll be sending you that button to click and automatically get those emails out to your state legislators and local uh, leaders. Um, so those are some really easy ways that we can do it. Another thing that I would say is uh, give to the PAC, give to your state PAC, give to the ARCA PAC, the federal PAC. Um, these are uh, what PACs do is they engage with uh, candidates and electeds and they work to get them elected. And we're, we're contributing to folks who, uh, who uh, uphold our values and who give, you know, who care and have jurisdiction over the issues that we care about. But more importantly, we're enhancing your voice because what ARCAPAC does is it, it, it amplifies what you do. Hopefully you all are contributing to candidates in your local area. You're investing your uh, time and energy into campaigns because that's really like at the ground level, that's where stuff is happening politically. Um, making those relationships with new legislators and helping the ones who are, who are doing good things for you, that's really an important part of the whole you know, process. Um, but PACs amplify your voice. And, and so that's good. So there's lots of ways you can do that. And if you really want a really super simple thing to do, you can uh, text AIA to 40647. I may have that wrong. I'm going to have to go look it up real quick, but I think it's that. If you do that, then you'll get on our list. And if not, you can just email me directly, Cindy Schwartz, S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z, right down screen, um, at AIA.org, and I can get you the link. But um, the, uh, uh, that, that will just put you in our network, and, and you'll get lots of updates and stuff. So that's, those are some quick, easy ways. At, at, in a non-AIA way, I would say, the first thing that you should do is educate yourself. Read the papers, read the blogs, know what's going on with others who are doing it. That the easiest way to get started is with a friend. Uh, Cindy, I, I completely agree with you on the reading the papers as a transplant. Like I said at the, at the start, I am not from Rapid City. I'm not from South Dakota. Um, I needed to find an easy way into finding my voice and it really started at a really small level um, in, in some ways, right? It's, it started with the mayor. It's starting with like reaching out to the mayor to, to discuss something that I, I felt I, need, I had a strong voice, not, and then Salim, I, I wanna acknowledge that politicians love to talk they also can see through. If it's self-serving, it is going to be entirely evident, right? So I always, and it's something that makes me feel very uncomfortable, the transparency of being self-evident and like like almost self-dealing and like benefiting myself. It is something that, um, and I don't, I, I think it's probably a cultural thing. Um, it makes me very uncomfortable. So I, I always go for the greater good um, in that sense, but to start, um, city council people, mayors, like politicians love to talk, state legislators, like you can buy them a cup of coffee and they're more than happy to sit down and visit about things. So, um, and that is a lot less, it was an easy uh, gateway for me to move up to other levels of uh, advocacy as well. Just, I needed to, and in my sense, it was making sure that my neighborhood was taken care of before I took my talents somewhere else, right? Like before it, I, I even talked to at the at the state level, like I really wanted to to lend my voice to some of the local issues. And that was important for me, for creating the community that I want to see my kids grow up in. Patrick, I think you, you to, to build on what you just said, I think you kind of talked a little bit about it earlier too, is just sort of being the person that raises, raises their hand, right? Um, in the room and it's, it's gotten you into, into trouble, but uh, usually it works out. It does, right? Well. I also have some rules. I don't have a, to have a position or a comment for everything either. I, and it is, it is self-preservation at that point. If it puts me in an uncomfortable position and I haven't thought through it, I find that I gain more respect by saying, give me just a little bit of time to process through this. Again, I know what language I'm really strong at and what part of the language I'm not. So for me to make sure that I have that um, 
and then figuring out the resources like Cindy was saying like she was posting the policy platform and figuring out where things are but I don't I don't always have to perform when asked for either right like and when you put yourself out there, you can find yourself in uncomfortable situations. And it is okay to say, you know, I haven't thought through this like well enough. I would love to hear more about it. Then you put the onus on them as well to, to educate you on their side, um, which is, is one of my defense mechanisms a lot. It's like, I'm not totally sure. Can you tell me more about it? And then they essentially lay it out for you and you can make up your mind when you're doing the work. Um, to Follow on Patri, that Patri made a, a gave a really good example of um, a, a, a very uh, prevalent obstacle to uh, advo- to folks getting engaged in advocacy. Um, lobby days, you go and you're sitting in front of a legislator and you're really nervous because you don't know exactly. You're afraid you might get that, you know, question and you don't know everything in the legislation. You don't know all the details of it. Um, An important thing to always keep in the back of your mind is no one, legislators uh, and their staff, they do not expect you to be an expert. They expect you to be someone who cares and who knows what you know, not anything else. You're not expected to be a legislative genius or someone who can sit there right away and help them mark up a bill. That is not, that's not why you attend those meetings. It's not why you're advocating. You're advocating because you bring a perspective on an issue that is informed by your, by your service and by your profession and by your education. It is informed by that. And what you bring to the table is that experience. Legislators take that experience combine it with the experience of others, and then they build legislation around that to, to, um, to promote the greater good or to solve a problem or to meet a challenge. And it's always really important to remember that because I've, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a lobby briefing and people are like, can I see the bill? And honestly, my response is you don't need the bill. You just need to know what you know. Here's some talking points. My husband, who's in the background making lunch, will tell you that I believe I can run the world with three talking points. I don't need anything more. <laughs> that and my passion, and I'm good to go. If you don't know something, um, as Patrick said, you can always say, you know, I don't know. I, but I'll, we can find out. Cindy, and finding out and coming back and circling is like a second touch that you have with that person, right? Like, it's, it works. So we are about a quarter after the hour. Um, I want to, at, at this point, I'd, I'd love to open it up. Bruce, uh, Karen, uh, even to the, to the wider group here, if there are any questions for our panel, um, welcome those at this time. Feel free to jump in. Yes, if, you, if you'd like to add a, a question to the chat, please do so now and we'll recognize you and, and call upon you to, to ask the question. But um, I'll start it out uh, by asking Cindy a specific question here. Cindy, you you mentioned at the start when you introduced yourself, your passion for giving others the opportunity to speak, uh, for their voices to be heard. Um, You and I worked together on ARCAPAC at National and a few other things, but one of the things I know you brought forward was the Speak Up program. Um, I wonder if you could share with us your your thoughts on that and, and, and how maybe we can use that to to move our advocacy program here in Ohio uh, forward. You know, we obviously have these programs, but I think that could create another opportunity and not a whole lot of people had the chance to be part of that. Karen did, I know, uh, on the call, she had a chance to be there, but be interested in hearing your thoughts on on how we might take what you've developed and and put that in place here in Ohio. Um, Thank you for that little, you know, PSA. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, the Speak Up, uh, Speak Up program is actually really near and dear to my heart. Um, it was, as a person who uh, toiled in the nonprofit world, uh, the, the, the left-leaning nonprofit world, for many, many years, um, which is a seriously under-resourced uh, place to be, <laughs> we, um, you know, I did a lot of training. AIA afforded me the opportunity to create Speak Up, which is really an amazing training uh, suite of stuff. 
Um, essentially what it is, is it's based on a manual called the five elements of a campaign. And uh, they are the five pieces that an organization and leaders in an organization should use, look at um, as they're developing a campaign. It's really a campaign tool. It is, an, it is a tool for you to take your passion, add it to a group, decide what it is that you want to work on and then win. It is based on winning. Um, I come out of, as I mentioned also, the campaign world. And I am very, very focused on winning, uh, not just advocating for the sake of advocating, which I guess is okay. You know, educating people is always a good thing. But honestly, I like to win. <laughs> I'm very competitive and I, I want to make things happen and I want to change the world. And that's why I do this work. So winning is key. The five elements of the campaign, uh, basically it talks about coalition development. It talks about using PACs to further your work. It talks about how to develop a campaign with tools, with worksheets, with um, a, a campaign template. Um, it talks about power mapping, which uh, power mapping is how do I figure out who has the influence so that I can go and talk to them and get things done, right? How, not just throwing a dart and seeing what sticks, not talking to my friends all the time because, you know, your friends are nice in the legislature, but you know, who cares? If you don't get the guys who are in the middle, that it, you don't get, you don't win, right? So, so it's all about winning. So power mapping, targeting, um, and it talks about how to grow your organization through campaigns, which a lot of folks don't think about. I happen to think is incredibly important. Uh, you guys are, I'm sure, all vested in, in AIA Ohio. Um, so it, this tool will help you not only build campaigns, but it will help you um, grow AIA Ohio, which is a good thing for you and a good thing for the profession. Um, there are all kinds of tools in Embedded, and that manual is available. Kate, if you don't have it, I'm, I will get you the whole slew of stuff uh, for you to look at. Um, and then I, uh, as part of the speak up piece, I participated in what we call mini speak ups, which are taking that very large two day training that we developed um, and taking pieces of it and applying that into components so that they can um, hone their skills in specific areas. So that's what speak up is. Uh, for me, it is a labor of love because again, uh, back to Elizabeth, it is about uh, actualizing and operationalizing passion and winning, not just, you know, trying. <laughs> not just talking, yes. <laughs> well, we, well, we appreciate that, Cindy. I, I think we'll be able to, to take you up on that at some point because I, I think it was a, a great tool that you put together and, and hopefully uh, something that we can use. I love the mini speak up idea. Um, but I, I'm going to shift gears here a little bit, uh, still looking for more questions, but I'm going to reach out to Patrick. And, and you kind of did answer this or address this, but um, I, I'm, I'm interested in a little bit more. Um, you know, a lot of our architects say we're introverts. We're not really extroverts. And, um, you know, it's sometimes hard for us to, to do things. I find um, your story a little interesting because, you know, not only are you uh, going out and, and using your passion to make things happen, but you're doing it when you had to move so many different places, all over the place, and you really had to make things happen quickly. I mean, it's not like you could sit down and say, well, let me see how this works in this community for five years or 10 years, and then maybe I'll get involved. Um, how, did, how did you really make that happen? I, I mean, some people are in the community for their lifetime, and they're only comfortable when they're been there, you know, doing things 30 years. How did you really just make that happen? Was it just, you, you just took the simple idea and just carried it forth everywhere you went? Or, or I'd like to hear, hear your answer to that. Um, because I don't, like you said, have the luxury of, uh, of being, of living uh, where I grew up. I figured that I needed to make a community for myself to feel like I was part of the community. I do not know. Be, uh, Rapid City is the longest place we have been in because my husband ended up separating from the Air Force um, about a decade ago. So we decided to make Black Hills our home. But I realized that in order for me to understand, to understand what ails and what makes Rapid City, which is a community that I uh, that I chose to be part of, I needed to really 
be part of the community. So that means that I started by sitting on boards, volunteering for committees. I, I Again, because this is a place that I have lived in uh, for the longest like period of time, I don't know if this holds true for every community, but this place is fueled on volunteers. Like it is 100% powered by people who are serving through boards, through passions, like whether it's social services or like wraparound services for affordable housing, it all starts with a set of volunteers. And it's not a fixed set. It's not your usual suspects. Like there's always like this, um, this thing where people are sharing their talents. So you were talking about being introverts and people, uh, and I think introverts and extroverts both have like, end up with like sort of a stigma around them or a bad word. Like, I think we're all a little bit of like somewhere in between. Um, going out there and speaking in my second language is extremely hard for me. I consider myself an ambivert. It takes, it wipes me out to, to do these things because I have to put, like, it, it takes a lot of energy from me, right? If we're one-to-one, -one, we can talk all day long, but putting myself out in front of other people, it takes a lot of my energy to do that. But I, I figured that I needed to start proving that I was worth the community investing in me by me investing in the community. And it really started with sitting on the board of Habitat for Humanity, um, sitting on the building committee for the YMCA. That's how you figure out what's really happening in your community. When you figure out those services that really have their arms around, I started with Habitat because it had to do with affordable housing and the built environment, the YMCA childcare because my kids went there and then I realized that they actually provide 35 different programs in my community. There's a lot that you get to figure out when you do that. The other side is there's always a lawmaker or some sort of like political person in any of those boards. So you start making those connections. Um, if you don't have like funny boots like to wear when you go meet the John Thune, probably his, which is true, his West River uh, chief of staff is probably sitting on a board. So then you start building coalition and you get to prove that you know, right? Like what Cindy was saying is like, you have to do your homework and you have to, you don't have to be the expert, but you have to be able to lend our unique point of view to whatever point of the community you're looking for. So I I needed to serve my community before I wanted my community to be behind me. And that's how I decided to do it. I always, I always do that. I put the mute on and then forget. Um, <laughs> but no, fantastic answer. I, I appreciate that because I, I think it's a, a very unique circumstance. And, uh, and like you said, getting, a, getting engaged, um, you know, uh, within the community first really makes a difference. Uh, there is a question from Alex, and, and maybe this is something that Cindy will be able to answer better. Uh, Alex, do you want to get off of mute and ask the question directly? Sure, I can do that, Bruce, thank you. Um, so I, I was kind of flipping through the, the public policy after you shared the link for that, and there's a lot of good information there. I just wanted to ask, is there, is there any limitation on us when we're talking with local politicians, representatives, is there any limitation on us kind of using that as, as a backbone of uh, saying, hey, here's what AIA stands for, here's what AI is interested in, and then related to that, to what extent, when we're interacting with these uh, with these people, are we in a position to say, "I'm speaking for AIA" versus "I'm speaking for myself"? Um, Kate, you might want to tag team with me on this one, but um, generally speaking, if you are talking to state legislators um, and if you're just on your own, you know, do what you're going to do. Uh, if you are, if you want to represent AIA, you need to check in. And there's a couple of reasons that you need to do that. Um, one, uh, you know, if you've got a state lobbyist, this is certainly true at the federal level, but if we have state lobbyists or federal lobbyists, they are likely uh, working the state house or Capitol Hill. They're working it, they're working issues. You're, you, it, it's important to make sure that the messages that we send to them are always consistent, right? You don't ever want to bollocks up something because, you know, all of a sudden it's like, well, I heard from here, but then I heard from this member that they said so-and-so, I'm confused, right? Um, so just from a practical perspective, coordination is really key. Um, 
from a from a uh, an organizational perspective, making sure that the message that is sent is is important. Um, particularly when you're talking about things like legislation, um, things can get kind of tricky, particularly if you're at a particular point in the session where maybe a bill's crossing over or um, amendments are being talked about or right, all of a sudden your support for a bill, may the organizational support for that bill may have changed from where you think it is, right? So it's just always really important to understand that legislation particularly can either move at a snail's pace or like lightning, right? It is, it is, it's highly unpredictable and often at the will of a legislator or the timing of the session. So it's really important to check in and understand the situation you're walking into, right? So that's one. And then um, it's, it's important to make sure that, that if you're gonna represent the organization that you're doing that in the right tone and in the right, uh, in the right message to the right person. The other thing that I would say is that, but when you are talking to legislators, in, in most every case, it, we do want you to say that you're with AIA because that says something that's really important. That says, hi, you know, I'm Cindy and I'm here with the AIA. And now all of a sudden, I'm not Cindy, a person who lives in Silver Spring, Maryland. I am Cindy, who's got 95,000 people standing behind her. And now I am, and, and I am a part of an industry and I am part of a, a class of expertise. Like all of a sudden I represent more than some of my parts. So the, the representative moniker, hugely important. Making sure you're coordinated, that you're accurate and that your timing is right is key. Always coordinated. Thanks. Thanks for that, Cindy. And and I know that, you know, most of our bylaws and everything, basically, it's the president of the organization, whether it's a chapter or, or a state or whatever, speaks on behalf of the organization. And basically, if you are there representing that organization, you're following uh, already those talking points that have been developed. So that I think that's really important that it, it's one voice. And, uh, you know, we have to make sure we follow that. But good question, Alex, great question. Uh, Matt, I, I think we have one question that we wanted to throw out to the rest of our panelists before they quickly jump. <laughs> we, we end our time here. So Matt, do you, would you, can you ask that question? And, and we're asking our panelists for a quick, quick answer. Matt? Or maybe not. So, so let, let me maybe may jump to this real quick and, and ask um, a, a question of, of the panelists here. So what is the uh, one thing that you would like to, I, I think what, the one thing that really pushed you to move forward within this organization? What, what, uh, what is it that, that, you know, you can say quickly, this, this influence had a big influence on me. And Cindy, why don't you start? What, what, what one thing all uh, for your whole life? What was it that pushed me to AIA? They hired me. That was pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad um, they I, did. <laughs> but I, I will say that the reason that I came here was because I felt like it was an opportunity to work with designers and artists, and that was personally really just intriguing. To me. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Laura, how about you? Uh, I would say just like do the thing, the thing that you're mm -hmm. interested in, the thing that you're passionate about, get involved in it, um, see it through. Many, many, many things, many opportunities that can let you do that too, I think. And, and you've showed that especially getting involved at, at a very young age within the profession. I think you, know, you have a great, great opportunity, great career uh, ahead of you and, and standing out, you know, um, so early in your career is, is fantastic. Patrick, we'll, we'll close out with you. Thanks. Um, so the thing that propelled me was uh, that I didn't see anyone who sounded or looked like me. Brown women in the profession are very, very rare and in the region. So I figured that I could I could separate myself uh, pretty quickly in that sense. The same way, and I will say, if you're a, a, a white uh, man, you can do that also by uh, showing passion and demonstrating your, your passion for what we do, that unique point of view, like Cindy was saying. And honestly, the thing that propelled me was um, AIA South Dakota uses a grassroots and speak up to 
grow uh, baby architects into finding their voice um, <laughs> and attending some of those sessions really um, r really resonated with me. I didn't want CEUs for bituminous uh, paint. I wanted CEUs for how to grow the voice and like go for the greater good and push others um, to come along with me. So those were the things that propelled me and that armed me with the information. Oh, that's great. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I turn this over to Karen Planet, our president, for any last final comments or words. Uh, Karen? Jeff, thank, thanks, Bruce. I'd like to thank all our panelists for sure today. This has been a really inspiring to hear your stories and service and leadership that you have provided to the AIA and, and, and your communities. If you didn't see it, there is a link in the chat for your CEU, so make sure you click on that uh, quickly here. We've got a less than a minute left. Um, <laughs> please join us on uh, Wednesday, June 30th for the fifth session in our advocacy series. It's gonna entitled in Implementing a Successful Advocacy Plan. I think everybody's well teed up for that. I think that's gonna be a good program for us as well. Uh, big thank you to Matt, uh, for Toddy for moderating today, Bruce for your help and Kate Brunswick as always. Um, appreciate everybody get, making this a program a reality for our members. So with that, thank you all. Have a good day. We'll see you in June. Thanks, everyone.